Hey guys, this is Sam with Mad Gear, and today we're going to talk about Meshtastic in an emergency situation. Now, I've gotten tons of comments that'll say something like, Meshtastic is a toy, it's just a gadget, it's okay for hobbyists, but there's no way I'd use it in an emergency. And to be honest, this viewpoint is based on some valid observations, and I'm going to address all of those observations today in this video. But before we get into it, please go ahead and like and subscribe. It helps us grow the channel and it'll help us offset all of the dislikes that we're probably gonna get for simply explaining uh, some of the background on Meshtastic and why I think that it's good for an emergency preparedness situation. And yes, to specify, I'm taking the stance of Meshtastic is sufficient for an emergency situation. So I've built hundreds of Meshtastic nodes. I've posted a lot of Meshtastic content, all centered around the idea of using Meshtastic in a preparedness or emergency type of situation. Now, I've gotten tons of comments that'll say something like, Meshtastic is a toy, it's just a gadget, it's okay for hobbyists, but there's no way I'd use it in an emergency. The main problem is that most people who are critiquing Meshtastic are not actually critiquing the underlying technology, but rather one specific part of Meshtastic, and I'll explain that in the video as well. In order to fully critique Meshtastic, I'm going to start by talking about all the different components that make a Meshtastic device Meshtastic, so that we can pick apart the different details and see which critiques actually have merit and which ones are just noise. But to really understand Meshtastic, we have to look at it as a multi-layered tech stack. At the very bottom, we have the actual modulation on radio waves, the actual physics happening with Meshtastic. At the very top, we have the user interface. So this is what most people are gonna see. That's actually pressing the buttons, actually pulling up the app on your phone and interfacing with the physical device. And there's a bunch of stuff in between, and that's what we're gonna get into right now. At the very bottom, we have just basic RF. So the frequency that Meshtastic uses, at least in the United States, is the 902 to 928 megahertz ISM band. So this is a public, unlicensed frequency range that anybody can use. You don't have to do any paperwork, you don't have to have a license, you can simply buy the device and use it right away. This is not unlike Wi-Fi and Bluetooth devices. They also are things you can just buy and use right away. The device itself is what is licensed and approved for use, not the user specifically. And this is a key distinction between things like GMRS radio. This range that Meshtastic uses is solidly UHF line of sight. So if two radios can see each other, they can probably talk to each other. Now there are limitations like power and signal degradation, but effectively with a sensitive enough receiver and a powerful enough transmitter, you could get the job done as long as the two can see each other. The key critique would be that the 900 megahertz band is not useful or perhaps it's too noisy. I've heard both of these. And I'll concede that yeah, the, the band can be pretty noisy, but there's a caveat here that makes that a non-factor when you're talking about Meshtastic. Number one, Meshtastic uses LoRa with resilient communications. Devices using this technology can pick signals out of the noise floor pretty easily. So even if the band is noisy, the way that Meshtastic utilizes LoRa, which utilizes chirp spread spectrum or derivative thereof, actually makes a noisy environment not that big of an issue. Not quite a non-factor, but not a big issue. And on the other hand, if we're talking about a noisy environment, we're talking about Internet of Things and other devices in the area that might be relying on electricity. In an emergency situation, if electricity is out and all these devices are no longer receiving power, we might end up in a noiseless environment anyways, making this argument even weaker. And lastly, to address this critique, as far as 900 megahertz go, it's all about how you are structuring your network. So saying that UHF line of sight is not sufficient for any type of decentralized communications network to be used in an emergency is not a sufficient argument. Different types of terrain may be better or worse suited for UHF line of sight. You might want to rely on something more like HF NVIS, but the issue with that is you need a license and it costs a lot more money. Your average person is not going to be conducting HF NVIS communications, whereas Meshtastic are cheap devices that don't require a license. It would be a lot simpler to build out the infrastructure using Meshtastic devices than it would be to instead convince everybody in your local area to 
get their general class ham radio license and all become ham operators. So now let's peek under the hood of Meshtastic. What is it that Meshtastic is built on? If Meshtastic is up here, then right below it is LoRa or Long Range. So LoRa, again, Long Range, is a proprietary radio modulation technique based on chirp spread spectrum. So really it's a derivative of chirp spread spectrum. Now, if this all sounds like gibberish, what you really need to understand is that it's just the way that information is put onto those radio waves. It's just a special method. And what really makes it special is its resilience in a noisy environment. So I know I mentioned it earlier, but I'll say it again here. LoRa and chirp spread spectrum are capable of being picked out of the noise floor. So if there's a lot of noise in your area or if the signal is being received from very far away, LoRa receivers are able to pick those signals out. To get a little deeper, chirp spread spectrum is basically an encoded chirp, which is really just a signal that sweeps across some spectrum of frequencies. Now the width of this band of frequencies can be changed with the spread factor, but that's pretty deep and we don't really need to get into that. But what you need to know about spread factors is that you can in fact tune the way that the radio waves are being sent. So you can make the signal easier to pick out of the noise floor, which comes with the benefit of extra range, but a lower data rate, or you can make the spread factor smaller. You can make the radio wave not go as far, but carry more data. All right, time for our next critique. The data rate is pathetically slow. And honestly, yeah, it is very slow. But again, this is not a flaw. This is a deliberate engineering trade-off. There are no easy ways to have long range, low power consumption, and high data rate comms. And if there are, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to check it out. Laura is optimized for what matters the most in an emergency which is low power consumption and sending critical emergency messages only. So think text or GPS coordinates. So although you won't be able to send voice memos or pictures, you can still send critical text messages to people in your network. So now that we have an idea of what the use case really is, it's easier to frame the situation. We're not talking about Wi-Fi or even Bluetooth. We're talking about something that is simply used for sending text messages. So it would be a valid critique, in my opinion, to say that Meshtastic is limited because it is incapable of sending higher data rates. But in an emergency preparedness situation, that's not always the goal. The two more quick things before we actually talk about the top layer, which is Meshtastic. The first thing is alternatives. There are other types of technology that utilize this 902 to 928 megahertz band, like XB Digimesh. If you've heard of Beartooth, Beartooth uses XB Digimesh, which is basically another type of technology similar to LoRa, but not exactly. It boasts a higher data rate. And to my understanding, you can send, uh, I think, voice messages and pictures using Beartooth, but you do sacrifice range. The devices are not cheap either. Even on sale, they're about $750. So that's pretty unapproachable for most people. Compared to Meshtastic, where devices start around $50 and move up to about $100 for uh, the more Gucci stuff. And aside number two, we don't have any sponsors. Instead, I'm the sponsor. I'll tell you real quick what we do in the preparedness sector. Madgear has two products, contingency planners and our app Ready Plan. The main idea is that you need to make a plan before an emergency strikes. So we give you the tools necessary to get started with planning. Our app has tutorials and guides and a way to share your plans. And our physical planners are waterproof, tearproof, and they have guides and templates which guide you through making your first preparedness plan. If that's something that interests you and you want to support us, please go check out our app and check out our planner. You can find links down in the description. Okay, back to Meshtastic. So Meshtastic is really just the software that sits on top of LoRa, CSS, and the hardware components. The actual interface that you have with your devices, the message routing protocol, the unique device identities, all of that stuff is managed by the Meshtastic software. Using the software doesn't require the internet, it doesn't require Wi-Fi or cell service. It does require Bluetooth, but I need to specify this because I've had to address it many times. Bluetooth does not equal internet. If you are connecting to a device using Bluetooth, that does not mean that you have to be connected to the internet. I get this question a lot and it's just not the case. So even in an off-grid emergency situation, if your phone has battery, you are still going to be able to connect to your device. If your phone does not have battery, that's a different story. Some Meshtastic devices do not require you to connect with them to use them. 
For example, the Lilygo T-Deck Plus has a screen and has buttons and a trackball and something called the Meshtastic user interface, which allows you to look at the screen and interface with the device directly without using a device like a phone connected via Bluetooth. The next thing to dig into is the way that Meshtastic handles message routing. So I'm not gonna go into network topology too much, but the idea of a mesh network is that all these different nodes can communicate with each other and route messages automatically, thereby meshing. If one node in the network goes down, that's okay because the other nodes can continue routing messages around where that node was. Unless that node was a really critical node that was say connecting two very distant areas, in which case you could build a more resilient network. Next, I'll touch a little bit on security. So Meshtastic does have AES-256 encryption. This isn't on the main channel, but any subsequent private channels that you create and share the key with other people, you can indeed have an AES-256 encrypted channel. Now that does not mean that your messages are perfectly secure. If somebody in the group who has that key loses their device, then the entire channel can be compromised because then the key can be used to basically unlock that channel. Just a quick side note, a pro tip, if you ever have an infrastructural node that is out and about, say like on a water tower, on an antenna mast, out in public somewhere, that node should not be loaded with any keys. It can route messages blindly without knowing exactly the keys inside. Time to address another critique. Meshtastic is open source software. That means it's gonna be buggy and not very secure. Rather than Meshtastic being developed by a company that could either A, lose interest because it's not profitable, or B, go bankrupt, it's actually more resilient because there's an entire community and movement based around Meshtastic, and anybody who's involved and motivated can make their own updates and changes. This means that as the community grows and gets more contributors, Meshtastic will actually get better. Now, if you've used it in the past, you might have seen bugs that were quickly squashed. I've tracked Meshtastic for a few years now, and through the time I've been using it, it's definitely gotten a lot better. So it's one of those things that ages well. Over time, I anticipate Meshtastic will continue to get better. Then what is the biggest flaw of Meshtastic? Well, this is the one that really matters in my opinion. The most valid piece of criticism that I've heard is that the hardware is just meh. You have to buy a development board, you have to buy special batteries and make sure the polarity is right and plug in all these little delicate connectors. You can buy all-in-one units, but really that's a recent thing. That wasn't always a thing. In the past, you had to piecemeal everything together. So a lot of people that are burnt by Meshtastic had an unreliable development board, and because they weren't able to troubleshoot at the level required to get the thing working, they just said, no, this doesn't work, I'm done. And that's totally valid. Not everybody's looking to buy something that you have to tinker with. Tinkering is its whole own thing. I mean, I, I personally like to tinker. That's something that I enjoy doing, but some people just want it to work out of the box, and that's fine, and at this time, there are some Meshtastic devices that will do that, like the Lilygo T-Deck Plus and a couple of other, like the T-Echo, but otherwise there is some tinkering involved. For those that say Meshtastic is a toy for hobbyists or for tinkering only, kind of. There are plenty of infrastructural nodes that can be built or purchased that are very resilient. Solar panels, batteries, completely waterproof, capable of withstanding high winds, ice, and lasting almost indefinitely in the elements. The issue is you typically have to build these, and if you don't build it, it's probably gonna cost you hundreds of dollars. I personally have a node that is on top of my house right now that's made it through really, really gusty winds north of 80 miles an hour, through lots of ice, lots of snow, and it hasn't skipped a beat. I'm regularly able to get a 10 miles of propagation with my repeater that I have on top of my house. But I did have to build it, and that's not something everybody is willing to do. Mestastic is not a network you buy, it's more of a network that you have to build. And this really only lends itself well to people that understand how to build one of these networks and have the resources and time, or people who live in an area where other interested parties have already begun building those networks. You need a critical mass of people in an area who are willing to either put up infrastructure or reconstitute communications networks 
after an emergency has already occurred. So some people might have Meshtastic nodes ready to go in an emergency situation. They will put these up on top of water towers or on top of antenna masts and get communications going. But that requires a very involved populace. Until we see wide adoption of Meshtastic or ready out of the box, IP67, waterproof, tactile knobs, easy to use antenna already attached type devices, almost like walkie talkies. Wide adoption of Meshtastic is going to be tough. And a lot of people who say the Meshtastic is a toy or a hobbyist gadget, they have a point. But that does not mean that it's not useful and that does not mean that it can't perform in an emergency situation. If it's not the 900 megahertz band, it's not chirp spread spectrum, it's not LoRa, and it's not meshtastic as in the software user interface, is it the hardware? I'd say the hardware is probably where there's any credence to these criticisms. With enough tinkering capability, the hardware is not an issue and Meshtastic can survive in an emergency, but that's not always a given. So really it's gonna come down to the practitioner. You, are you the right person to use Meshtastic? Well, if you wanna know more about how to increase your range with Meshtastic, check out this video. And if you wanna know more about some of the common all-in-one Meshtastic devices, check out this video. The technology stack is viable. The real question is, are you ready to implement it? Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.